जयंति मंगला काली भद्र काली कपालिनी दुर्गा क्षमा शिवा धात्री स्वाह स्वधा नमोस्तुते क्रीं कालक विदे स्मशानवासी धीमह तन्नो घोरे प्रचोदया ओं तन्नो घोरे प्रचोदयात कत्यायनाय विमे कन्याकुमारी धीमह तन्नो दुर्गी प्रचोदया ओं तन्नो दुर्गी प्रचोदयात ओम नम चंडिकाय ओम शांति 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 हरि ओ Om victory unto the goddess the power of all mantras may the dweller in the cremation ground the terrifying kali illumine my mind om salutations to chandika om peace 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 om good evening one and all we have a very very special class today So as you know it's the 3rd year anniversary of this studio Yoga World Heart and so they've been kind enough to make these classes publicly available and open to one and all so for the whole week like all the classes are just free anybody can come and so I thought you know to celebrate the fact that we've been doing this together for 3 years and also to celebrate the fact that we've just experienced 9 nights of intense devotion to the divine mother I thought we could do a special on the chandi So it's like a special Thursday night, Tantra Thursdays. We won't look at the Vigyana Bhairava as we usually do. Uh, we've made quite a bit of headway into that text, and typically this is our time to like verse by verse comment upon that text, study that text, practice that text. And we've been doing it for about a year now, maybe a year and a half almost. We've been studying just the Vigyana Bhairava, and we're almost finished actually. But today I just want to step back a little bit from the Vigyana Bhairava and look look at another tantric text, which is so central to the tantric tradition as a whole. Um, and so today's class will be just on that, the Chandi, the Devi Mahatmyam, or the Shapta Sati. Okay, it's very exciting. But first, before we get into any of that, Karuna Devi, congratulations on your marriage, on no less than Durga Puja. How auspicious! So Karuna and Rishi just got married. Just so you know. Thank you. I have a little story. So yeah. we did like a very small ceremony, um, and we like hiked up a mountain. And there was one point where I was thinking, you know, it was like sunrise, and I was thinking like Jai Ma. You know, I started thinking Jai Ma. Like, and then all of a sudden Rishi starts singing Jai Ma, Jai Ma, and I was like, wait. Are you singing Jai Ma right now? I was like, you just read my mind. And then we were singing Jai Ma, and it's a little out of character for Rishi. Like that's not really like something he sings all the time. So it was like so beautiful. It was a very beautiful moment that I couldn't wait to share. I thought it was fitting. Like a true child of the Divine Mother, whether he knew it or not, <laughs> the sentiment bubbled up from deep within, and he couldn't help but say Jai Ma. <laughs> Yeah, we were saying. I was like, "Who's praying right now for us?" And like, I feel like everyone's praying right now right. to Durga and singing Jai Ma. And I just felt like joining in, even though I wasn't with anyone. It was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, at at here at home, as we were doing the daily Durga pujas, um, obviously you two have been in our hearts and in our minds, and I'm sure everyone here at the in the Sangha have all been celebrating you and also have been thinking about you. So yes, that energy I hope was palpable, and it's nice because you know Karuna Devi has had a close relationship with Goddess Durga for some time, and it's just so nice that you should be you know married on the day that Goddess Durga is celebrated, having triumphed over all the lower forces. It's a wonderful thing. You know, a very special thing to enter grihastha householder life. It's like a, it's like an initiation. It's just like when a monk becomes a monk. You know, it's like when a householder becomes a householder and walks thrice around the fire or seven times around the fire, depending on what the ceremony looks like according to the culture. That's like an initiation. And so, what an auspicious day to be initiated into a tantrika's favorite kind of 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 life, householder life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was a little upset about it because it was an accident, but I think it was all for a reason. It was very, very nice. No accident. So thank you. Yeah, right. I thought it was like the first night of Navaratri, not like the Durga Puja, but it was still very nice and beautiful, and yeah. I like loved everyone's check-ins. It was so cool to see how much Japa everyone was doing this year. 
It was just so beautiful. Yes, it was truly profound. It was a very profound time, this Navaratri, and always is. But I think as St. Anthony said so beautifully, best Navaratri ever. I hardcore mm -hmm. concur. Like, that's my sentiment also. We've had such a beautiful Navaratri all together in fellowship. And it's so beautiful to see everyone encouraging one another to intensify their sadhana, both in terms of quantity and also quality and intensity. It's been very special. And so I thought, you know, given all the fervor that we've experienced together as a community around the goddess Durga and Kali and around the Chandi and around, you know, Mahishasana, and just all the wonderful things that we uh, focus on during this period, I thought let's devote our class today wholly to this Chandi, this most sacred of Tantric texts. So sacred that it is itself is seen as a manifestation, a living manifestation, an embodiment of the Divine Mother. At Durga Puja, the Chandi is itself worship. It's the kind of book, like all books, but especially this book, it doesn't get put on the floor. It gets wrapped in a very special cloth. It gets placed on the altar. It's offered flowers and incense and fire, and it's treated like the goddess herself. That's the level to which this book is revered. You know, it's very, very sacred. It's 13 chapters and it features 700 verses. And the important thing about this book is that the verses aren't just verses. They're each and every one of them considered mantras, very potent mantras, because in each and every one of them, I mean, in many of them, all throughout the text are bij mantras, sacred seed syllables that have tremendous mystical value. Now, bij mantras don't necessarily have linguistic value, meaning they don't necessarily point to a particular thing in the world or to a particular experience. They don't really have a meaning in the typical sense that words have meaning, you know, but their meaning is so deep as to go beyond the mind. It's like a expression of pure non-dual consciousness beyond all form beyond all name beyond all thought beyond all speech it's like truth rendered into pure immediate vibration those bij mantras are many in number and you might have heard them tantric traditions are very big on bij mantras and this text has quite a good deal of them in fact maybe you can derive the vast majority of tantric bij mantras from this text alone so in the 700 verses in the 13 chapters of the chandi or the Devi Mahatmyam, or the Shapta Shati. Shapta Shati means literally 700. You get, I think, the, the, the main body of Tantric mystical literature. In terms of Bij Mantras, just alone, just from the Mantric point of view, that means, and this is the first thing I want to say before we begin today, that means that even if you don't understand the meaning of this text whatsoever, if you have no idea what at all is being spoken of or being discussed in this text, to simply chant it is itself um, enough. It's so powerful, just the resonance of it, just the sound of it, you know? Like, even when you hear the Sanskrit, it's not just like any old Sanskrit. I mean, all Sanskrit is beautiful and elevated, but this particularly so, it's a very exalted form of Sanskrit. You know, for instance, to give you a taste, in the second hymn, Shakra Dikrita Devi Stutihi, the opening line is, Dev ya 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 tatamidam jagadatma shaktya nishesha deva ghana shakti samuha murtya tamam bikam akila deva maharshi pujyam bhaktyana tasma vidadhatu shubhani sanaha. Oh, do you feel like just the power of that, you know, and the meaning is as follows to the goddess who spreads out this world, Devya, ya, ya, tatam idam, who spreads out idam, who spreads out all of this, uh, and who embodies herself as not only all the gods and goddesses, but as the powers of all the gods and goddesses. That Ambika, to her, we bow down in devotion. To Ambika, who is most worthy of worship, Maharshi Pujyam. Pujya, who is, who is most worthy to be adored. Pujya means to be revered. By who? By the great Rishis. <laughs> Karuna's husband's name is Rishi. Most worthy of being adored by Rishis and gods. By the great seers and the gods. To that Ambika we bow down in devotion. Bhaktya nata smavidadhatu. Shubhani sanaha. May she grant us that shubha. That which is good. That which is nice. That which is blessed. That which is auspicious. That's the opening line of the second hymn. One of the longer hymns of the four hymns in the chant. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just first and foremost want to say that this is a very, very powerful text. And it's a tremendous privilege tonight to be exploring it with you. And to be plunging into it um, wholeheartedly with Mother's blessings. So we pray to the Divine Mother that our minds may become saturated with the mantric force of this text. Wholly apart from its meaning, which is so profound and so beautiful and something we're going to explore quite a bit today, 
wholly aside from its meaning, its mantric force as a sound, as a resonance, as a vibration is itself something worth noting. Okay. So that means if you want to do a practice, a Devi Mahatmyam practice, maybe you decide to chant the hymns, maybe just the first hymn, maybe the third hymn, maybe all four hymns, maybe only on special days, like Tuesdays and Saturdays in the Tantric tradition are regarded as very sacred for Kali, Durga, the Divine Mother, or maybe new moon nights, Amavashyas are regarded as very sacred. Also, um, the ninth night of the moon, maybe only during Navaratri, maybe you chant it every day or some days, doesn't matter. If you just chant the mantras or just the Sanskrit, and, and you commit yourself to that alone, it will have a profound transformative effect on the psyche. But even more powerful than that, I think, is when you understand the meaning of the text, because it's so deep, it's so rich, it's so profound. So it's not just about chanting the text, it's also about lovingly, faithfully, and sincerely meditating upon and contemplating upon the meaning of the text. Um, the, the story being narrated by the Rishi, Medas Muni in the text. Like that story makes such an impression upon the mind. It's like a story within a story. So this Devi Mahatmya, these 700 verses appear within the wider context of the Markandeya Purana. So the Puranic literature, this is from a time in India, it's called the Puranic Age, maybe between 800, B oh, sorry, 600 BC, maybe, uh, I guess you could say like 1000 BCE to 600 BC, anywhere between this time period would be, I think, classically called the Puranic Age. However, I don't want to get into any dating because dating is a very controversial issue when it comes to like, scholarship around South Asian spiritual traditions. Because in India, you'll get like really, really old dates. Whereas in the West, you tend to get more conservative dates. So it's hard to really say when the Upanishads appeared and what have you. Maybe you could say, well, the Upanishads, the Vedas, they refer to this river, the river Saraswati, which we know for a fact through geological data dried up in the year, I think, 1500 BCE or maybe 1900 BC. Don't quote me on that. But we know that through geological data, it dried up at this certain time. So we know that the Upanishadic culture, the Vedic culture must have at least been older than that. Since for them, the river Saraswati was in full flow and like kind of the center of their civilization. And not only that, there's so much cultural continuity between the um, earlier group that was in this valley, the Indus Saraswati Valley, they're called the Mohenjo-Daro Harappan civilization and the Vedic civilization that many people think it's like one continuous tradition from time immemorial. You know, so what we're studying now is perhaps as old as time itself, or at the very least, it's as old as human civilization is old. We're studying something from the very dawn of our civilization, which to me alone is quite an interesting thing. So the Markandeya Purana, the Purana itself though, perhaps appears between 1000 BC to 600 BC, but the Purana, this mythic story is about a tradition that was perhaps extant since um, maybe 7000 BCE. Like there are some scholars who are able to radiocarbon date certain um, Harappan or Mohenjo-Daro Harappan seals to around that time. So this is maybe 7000 years old or 9000 years old, or let's just like for fun, let's just say this is really ancient, really old tradition. The Purana itself, which is part of this much older stream, might have appeared in the time period aforementioned. And in this Purana, the Markandeya Purana, there appears the Devi Mahatmyam. And in the Devi Mahatmyam, there's the story about these two fellas. One is a king, dispossessed, and the other is a merchant. Both of them approach a, a Brahmana, a, a Rishi. His name is Medas Muni. So Medas Muni is the teacher of the text. Surata, like Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita is kind of like our character. He's like our kind of interlocutor. And he's the one who puts questions to Medas Muni. And he's kind of like the voice of the text besides Medas Muni. Samadhi just kind of sits there silently. He's like really dejected. I'll tell you a little bit about them in a little bit. But it's just these three guys. The Brahmana, the Rishi, Medas Muni representing the Brahmins. Surata, the king representing the Kshatriyas. And Samadhi the merchant representing the Vaishas and the, the, the sage Medas Muni nourishes to them the story of the divine mother as she conquers the lower forces of human nature, namely various demons like Madhu and Kaitaba that appear in the first episode, Mahishasura who appears in the second episode, the prideful and self-conceited buffalo demon, and finally Shumba and Nishumba, the sensualist, indulgent sort of sattvic demons that appear in the third episode. And there are many other demons too. There's like Chikshura and Dumra Lochana, and there's Rakta Bija and all these wonderful demons. It's a very complex and rich demonology. And in the story, mother vanquishes them all with charm and grace. And every time she finishes in one of these episodes, once she van vanquishes the demon, typically before she's summoned or after she vanquishes it, there's going to be a hymn as we'll talk about a bit in, in just a few moments. And so the text is full of storytelling, wonderful exposition in verse about the mother's conquest of demons. And also it's, it's, it features four hymns to the divine mother that are daily sung all over the world and chanted and recited by shakas. 
So it's a very rich text. It's a story within a story within a story. The story of the Divine Mother slaying demons is nested in the story of Medas Muni consoling these two dejected fellows, Suratha and Samadhi, which itself is a story nested in the much broader context of the Markandeya Purana. So if any of you have read a text, a Puranic text, like the Bhagavata Purana, that very wonderful Vishnu Purana, or some of you might have read the Devi Bhagavatam, it's so beautiful. Like the text really just draws you in because it's stories within stories within stories within stories. You know, as if you forget like whose story you're in and then it's like you're pulled out. You're like, oh, I'm in the court of King Parokshit and Shukadev is telling me about you know, Narada and, and Narada is telling, you know, it's like just, it's so alluring and it really draws you into um, a different kind of time, a different kind of space. It's it, itself a very, maybe dare I say, psychedelic thing to just like read a Purana. So this Chandi, this Devi Mahatmyam, as we're about to study, is a story within a story within a story. And it's one of the central texts of Shakti Sadhana, that is devotion to the Divine Mother, or I could even go so far as to say Tantric Sadhana. It's one of the most important manuals of Tantra. So insofar as this is Tantra Thursdays, I thought, you know, let's let's just let's just do it. Let's pick it up and plunge right in. So here's how I foresee this class going. I'm gonna make a few opening remarks as I've already been doing about the text. I'm gonna show you a few resources about the text, and then we're going to plunge in the text itself. And we'll see how far into it we can get. I'll just kind of read through the English translation maybe. And every time I get to a hymn, I'm going to chant maybe, I don't know, maybe just the first and third. I think the second and fourth are a bit long. So I'll just maybe chant the first and third hymns in Sanskrit so you can get a flavor or a taste of what the original sounds like, just in its mantric power. But even the English, you know, is itself very, very powerful. Just the way it describes what's going on, the psychodrama of it, like just to hear it in English, even that has a profound transformative effect. I was in the desert with Dayaprana Mataji and we were just reciting this text cover to cover, but in English. And Daya Pranamataji, the to me, mother embodied, she said, like, just see how powerful the English alone is. You know, Sanskrit aside, just knowing the story and hearing the story, and more importantly, hearing it all in one sitting. You know, Raymond G is here now, he's sitting here. And that was your first time, right, on Tuesday, hearing the text? Yeah. I, I'm this. I'm not making him say this. Like, I don't have like a, I'm not holding up a car. It's like, how did you feel about the text? Yeah, I'm shaking. You're shaking? Yeah, I was shaking. Yeah, 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 it was the first time you heard it through. Yeah, it was the first time. Was yeah, first time. so we had a puja on Tuesday, the Vijaya puja, Dashami puja, and in that, and, and obviously, you know, throughout Navaratri, the, the text is recited daily. But we had two big public pujas. One was um, Tritya, the Tuesday before this one, and then the last one was Dashami. And Raymond was there for both of them. But this time, you heard the text all the way through, from start to finish, and it's your first time. And you you saw right, like how the room changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the chair just exploded. Which oh, yeah. <laughs> someone was just sitting like the chair just like broke and you could feel there was this palpable energy in the room and I love yeah yeah people became forgetful they like left things here <laughs> tears were streaming down people's like it was just like so powerful just in English I mean yes we chanted the hymns in Sanskrit and we were doing a puja and there were some other things but just the English of it so that's what I want to do I think the main part the main bulk of today's time together will be just looking at the English and just reading reading through and maybe we'll take some questions in the end now one thing I want to say before we begin is I want to address some of the superstitions around this text. This is very important. So listen closely. This part is important because when it comes to Tantra, especially when it comes to the Divine Mother, especially in a form as Mother Kali, you'll hear a lot of superstitionalism. <gasps> you can't do this. You can't, you can't recite this text. You need, you need special initiation to, to recite this text or not anybody can approach Kali. She'll kill you. She's very dangerous. You know, like all this kind of stuff. I won't stand for it. I think all of this is nonsense. And let me tell you why. Um, in fact, I won't tell you why. I'm just going to read to you from Swami Vekananda. Let the boss tell you why. So Swami Vekananda, our Lord in general, whose uh, directions and orders we stick to. I'm going to uh, um, read a little bit from his Raja Yoga. And here he talks about this kind of superstition mongering. You know, there's this there's this um, tendency sometimes that we have in India and all over the world to make something overly esoteric, like overly secretive, and then to shroud it not only in mystery and secrecy, but in a veil of superstitionalism, like to, to, to create fear around it. Why? Perhaps because like a few people, a select few, wanted to keep it all for themselves, knowing that these things are powerful and that they confer power. Maybe they became jealous and possessive of that power and to keep out the profane, 
you know, they created all these superstitions around who could practice it and who couldn't and what have you and all the dangerous consequences that could come to you if you if you so deign to do what you were never supposed to do, like all this stuff that really degenerates human nature. So I want to just before we begin reading the Chandi or talking about the Divine Mother, I just want to in one fell swoop shatter this degenerate superstitionalism that seems to gather like throngs of shadows at the doorway of the Divine Mother's temple. Let's not stand for it. Okay. I'm trying to find the um where is it where is it okay okay, okay. Yeah. that's the divine mother maybe saying hey no no don't do that <laughs> anyway, so here we go um now i'm gonna read to you from raja yoga this appears in volume one of swami vekananda's complete works in my edition it's page 131 this is the introductory statement so it's like one of the first chapters of the very important text, Raja Yoga, which is actually the first book in our required reading in the syllabus. So this this, this is from, hello, Joel, Namaskaram, welcome, welcome. So this is from Raja Yoga. Let's see what Swami Vekananda has to say. The end and aim of all science is to find the unity, the one out of which the manifold is being manufactured, that one existing as many. Raja Yoga proposes to start from the internal world, to study internal nature, and through that control the whole, both internal and external. It is a very old attempt. India has been its special stronghold, but it was also attempted by other nations. In Western countries, it was regarded as mysticism, and people who wanted to practice it were either burned or killed as witches and sorcerers. In India, for various reasons, it fell into the hands of persons who destroyed 90% of the knowledge. He's speaking about Patanjali Yoga Sutra. But of course, he's also speaking about the much vaster Raja Yoga tradition. So it fell into the hands of persons who destroyed 90% of the knowledge and tried to make a great secret of the remainder. In modern times, many so-called teachers have arisen in the West worse than those of India because the latter knew something while these modern exponents know nothing. Now, this next part is very important. Anything that is secret and mysterious in these systems of yoga should be at once rejected. Huh? The words of the boss himself, anything that is secret or mysterious um, in these systems of yoga should be at once rejected. See, he's talking about a very rational, grounded, and scientific approach to spiritual life. And so he's saying, if it's not that, if it's shrouded in all sorts of obfuscations and superstitionalisms and, and you know mystery mongering, then reject it. It's not strength giving. It's not life giving. It only makes you feel afraid. It makes it weakens you, right? So he says, anything that is secret and mysterious in these systems of yoga should be at once rejected. The best guide in life is strength. In religion, as in all other matters, discard everything that weakens you. Have nothing to do with it. Mystery mongering weakens the human brain. It has well nigh destroyed yoga, one of the grandest of sciences. From the time it was discovered, more than 4,000 years ago, yoga was perfectly delineated, formulated, and preached in India. It is a striking fact that the more modern the commentator, the greater mistakes he makes, while the more ancient the writer, the more rational he is. Most of the modern writers talk of all sorts of mystery. Thus, yoga fell into the hands of a few persons who made it secret, instead of letting the full blaze of daylight and, and reason fall upon it. They did that so they might have the power to themselves. Do you see that? Yoga fell into the hands of a few persons who made it a secret. Instead of letting the full blaze of daylight and reason fall upon it, they did that so that they might have the power to themselves. In the first place, there is no mystery in what I teach. What little I know, I will tell you. So far as I can reason it out, I will do so. But as to what I do not know, I will simply tell you what the book says. It is wrong to believe blindly. You must exercise your own reason and judgment. You must practice and see whether these things happen or not. Just as you would take up any science, Exactly in the same manner, you should take up this science for study. There is neither mystery nor danger in it. Do you hear, do you hear this? Swamiji is saying, of course, he's talking about Raja Yoga, Patanjali Yoga. But that too also gets a lot of like bad rep for being dangerous. Oh, Kundalini, you know, like you get, people talk about it as if it's something you should not attempt. It's very dangerous. He says, no, there is no mystery nor danger in it. So far as it is true, it ought to be preached in the public streets in broad daylight. Any attempt to mystify these things is productive of great danger. So this, my friends, is my main inspiration and intention in presenting the Chandi, the Devi Mahathamim to you. Because if it is true, 
If it is valuable, then it should be preached in the streets in broad daylight. Let the full blaze of daylight and reason fall upon it. Let us see that this text is not superstition. It's not mystery mongering. It's not dangerous. It's not shrouded in, in, in mystery. It's clear and beautiful and profound. And it strikes at the very heart as to what it means to be human. See, if something is true, then it is the common property of every man, woman, and child everywhere in the world from every race. I will not stand for this, um, what do you call, uh, gatekeeping. Where, oh, you have to be a Shakta, you have to get this initiation, that initiation. You must have some tantric sounding name with a very long kind of thing. And, you know, you must have, no, 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 no. You're all human beings. And all human beings have a right to approach the Divine Mother in any which way they want. She is the mother of the universe. Why should you fear her? Um, yeah, Karuna is saying one of the Ramakrishna monks used to chant the Chandi in the streets, which would freak out a lot of pundits, right? Like the fact that the Chandi is just chanted like openly, the fact that you would talk about Mother Kali like that openly, these things that were for so long kept secret, that would give many a Brahmin a heart attack, especially those in the Shakta traditions that really jealously, I think in many ways, guard these things. These I, I think I want to start off by saying, don't feel that way about this text. This text is for you. It must be for you. I mean, that's probably why the avatar of this age, I mean, of course, we can regard him in any light we want, but if we consider him to be an avatar, then it's kind of important that Sri Ramakrishna's Ishta was Makali, you know, a, a deity who had maybe for a long time been buried under layers and layers and layers of superstition and misunderstanding and what have you and, and fear mongering. But Sri Ramakrishna brings the goddess Kali into the broad daylight of the world's religious um, communities. You know, now, now more than ever, interest in Mother Kali is deepening. Probably because, to remind us, maybe, because the, the, the fact of the matter is that she's your very own mother, not a foster mother, but your very own mother. What child should be afraid of his or her or their mother? And what child should be made afraid of their mother by all this superstition mongering and fear mongering, right? That's the first thing I want to say. Enough with this. Uh, strike off the fetters of fear and superstition surrounding your love for the Divine Mother. What matters is love and sincerity. And you know what? If we're wrong about this, so be it. Let mother appear in all her wrath and fury, holding trident. May she spear me through the heart for making this grave mistake. At least that will be darshan. You know? <laughs> so after all, I'm mother's child. And if mother is the lord and lady of the universe, then I have my right to be an impetuous child demanding that she let me into the house, which is verily my own, you know? I'm mother's child. She's crazy, I'm crazy. And that's the way a shakta feels. You know, it says in the Devi Mahatmyam in the end, it says, one who chants this, recites this sincerely and lovingly, they become fearless. Fearlessness is the first sign of progress in spiritual life, according to Tantra in its Shakta variant. I mean, Swami Vivekananda says cheerfulness. Cheerfulness is the first sign of spiritual progress. And in a cheerful heart, there is no room for superstition, fear, or you know, suspicion like that. So be strong, be healthy, be reasonable, be grounded, be cheerful. And, and with that comes fearlessness. Be fearless when it comes to Chandi. She's your very own mother. You know? And if this Chandi is the manifestation of your mother, you have nothing to fear. It's a text of love, pure love. Okay. So that's my hot take. This is not something that is often said um, because often what you're going to hear about the Chandi is that, first of all, you need special initiation to be even talking about it, let alone reciting it. Second of all, to recite it, maybe you have to belong to a certain caste or you can only chant it at certain times of the day or at certain times of the year or of the month. Um, thirdly, you might hear that this is a very fierce goddess, a very fierce emanation. So you have to be careful. You have to be very precise with a lot of things, you know? So that's kind of the language that you typically hear around this text. So I once asked my guru about this. Um, and, you know, I asked him about two things. One, I asked him about puja, which is also something that's quite closely guarded. It's kind of an esoteric practice that you need initiation for. And I, you know, I asked him, what do you think about teaching puja to those who have not taken a formal tantric diksha, you know, who have not received mantra diksha or anything like that? And he said, if there's devotion, why not share it with them? You know, teach them. Why not? Share puja. Because what's there is like this genuine desire to approach God. And insofar as puja is the ritual and symbolic language of doing that, then why shouldn't everybody have access to it? That's one thing he told me. The second thing he told me regarding the chandi, I was like, do you need special initiation to chant the chandi? He's like, no, 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 not at all. If it's done with devotion, like, you know, devotion is the main thing. Your diksha is, your devotion is your diksha, so to speak when it comes to the chandi. So anybody can chant the chandi. Anybody can recite it. as if, if their heart is stirred by it, if they feel some inner calling to approach it and to chant it and, and be absorbed in it, why not? No special diksha is required. Okay. However, this fearlessness that I've just now been speaking about is not a foolhardiness. 
So at the same time, fearlessness is not flippancy. It's not irreverence. Fearlessness coming from a place of devotion and love will always bring with it a sense of respect and reverence. So like I sometimes talk about the new age communities, like neo-pagan communities who are maybe a little bit irreverent when it comes to Mother Kali insofar as they consider her just like a force that you use for certain ends. So it's not ma, 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 as Swami Bhajananda Saraswati once joked. It's me, me, me. So I'm quote unquote working with Kali. Why are you working with Kali? Because I, I don't know. I want to hex my ex-boyfriend or something. Hex my ex. So I want I want this or I want that. Um, so that that maybe that's something else. That's like when you're approaching with a certain level of irreverence. And we actually find that in the text. There's a character, Chumba, who wants to possess the Divine Mother for himself. He wants to marry her. Um, and so you'll see what happens to him. <laughs> and so generally this kind of attitude of irreverence of trying to possess the divine mother rather than lovingly surrendering to her, that maybe is to be discouraged. But I think the vast majority of people who want to study the Chandi are not really people looking for power or looking to use the mother for their own kind of worldly ends. I think the vast majority of people who want to read the Chandi are people who are genuinely interested in the goddess Kali and the goddess Durga, who genuinely feel the stirrings of devotion in their heart and want some way to deepen that devotion. So I think insofar as that is true, the Chandi is for everybody. However, there are certain guidelines around practicing it. So just because Raja Yoga is not something that you know you should fear, doesn't mean there aren't rules and regulations and guidelines to practice it properly with, with the right technique. So often, um, guru yoga is stressed in most of these traditions because it's, you know, in every case in life, like to do something correctly, you ought to have a living teacher guide you in it. So um, Swami Brahmanandaji, Raja Maharaj, when once asked about whether or not we need a guru, he would say, if even pickpockets need teachers, what more for realizing God? You know, if a, if a person wants to be a pickpocket, they have to approach a master pickpocket and then learn the art and science of picking pockets. If that's true for thieves, how much so for stealing the ultimate loot, God realization? You have to approach someone who has it, or who at least has um, some level of understanding about the way to get it. And so that person will be your teacher. So towards the end of the um, preface to Raja Yoga, Swami Vekananda, I'll read it to you maybe, it's kind of valuable. He stresses the role of a teacher, the importance of a teacher. So this is in the preface. And so he says here, Effort has been made, this is on page 121, um, to avoid technicalities as far as possible and to keep the free and easy style of conversation. In the first part, some simple and specific directions are given for the student who wants to practice, but all such are especially and earnestly reminded that, with a few exceptions, yoga can only be safely learned by direct contact with a teacher. If these conversations succeed in awakening a desire for further information on the subject, the teacher will not be wanting. So it's referring to that law that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So notice, you, you, it seems to be a tension. On one hand, we're saying, don't be afraid. There's, it's perfectly safe. There's nothing dangerous about it, nothing mysterious about it. And on the other hand, we're saying, well, to practice it safely, to practice it properly, you're going to have to approach a teacher. Can we have both? I think we can. I think we can approach something cheerfully with love and fearlessness and at the same time have enough reverence and respect for it to recognize that there are some things that I need to know before I practice it, some techniques. So while my guru said anybody can chant the chandi, he did suggest this, to take a bath first, to sit down at your altar and light some incense first, to create a sacred space, and then in a spirit of reverence and respect, take up the chandi. You know, now Daya Pranamataji, we were in the car together and I chanted the first hymn of the chandi and just when I finished it, she immediately... Um, chanted a hymn to Divine Mother, Sharada Devi. You know, she chanted to, um, she said, uh, you know, she chanted. And she said, you see, these things are not to be thrown about lightly. Th this text is very monthly charged, very potent. It can sometimes provoke or trigger people's psychological complexes. Like Raymondji was talking about yesterday, how you were shaking. There's, there's an energy to it, right? Like, yeah. So we need to contain that energy somehow. We have to ground that energy. So lighting some incense, taking a bath, sitting in freshly laundered garments, sitting at your altar, facing north or east, having a murti or a picture of your guru or practicing in the um, safety and security of your sangha with people that you trust. Like all of these, I think, are necessary steps. And, you know, it can be as simple as just taking the name of your guru or taking the name of God before chanting it. So Daya Pranamataji in that car ride, she really taught me how important it is to ground any recitation. Even if you just, you know, in the car chant the first hymn, maybe you should create some parameters around making sure that's the safest experience for everybody. So at the same time, don't be afraid of it, right? But at the same time, respect it and revere it and practice with it as if it's a living manifestation of the Divine Mother. That's the first thing I want to say. Okay, now the second thing I want to say is that in the Chandi, 
there's a story being told and um, the motif of gore is very present. It's quite a fierce and for some people quite disturbing story. So Diaprana Mataji in the desert, she said to a group of people, um, if this is your first time reading it, be forewarned. It's not for the faint of heart. You know, you'll there's scenes of mother like splitting elephants in half and um tearing demons limb from limb. It's yeah, it's a pretty rated R text. <laughs> you know, it's very fierce. The mother in the in the text, so sanguine, so gentle, so beautiful, so radiant. Yet, as Swami Prabhavanandaji would say, she's no nimbi pambi mother. She slaughters these demons and makes rivers of blood flow in the battlefield you know it's quite a fierce scene there's a lot of gore in the text a lot of um kind of lurid and vivid depictions of death and destruction and what have you so that being the case the recitation of the text itself can do two things one it can really purify you in a deep way because like just encountering all that destructive force can sweep aside or tear asunder all that is like not harmonious in you but also sometimes it can provoke those things it's like when you talk about demons and you think about demons like sometimes they come out of the shadows they were always there right like they're always lurking in the background of the sub subconscious and they're kind of influencing us from behind the scenes if you will these psychological complexes or these harmful non-harmonious forces that we might personify as demons they're always there but sometimes when we chant the chandi they might come out a bit now this isn't to scare you this is just to state a psychological fact what's being called demons here really just refers to um forces like lust anger greed fear um deceit all of these things that are very innate to the human condition like they're there in the mind so if you chant the chandi sometimes these things can come out you know that that, that people can sometimes get a reaction from these things so they come out and then they're destroyed that's the point so there's a lot of ferocity and power in the text but that power is required to deal with a very powerful foe the complexities of the subconscious mind so when you read it through you can think of it as a kind of cleansing a kind of purification much much like a, a, a greek tragedy might purify you it might help you work through elements and facets of the human experience you don't normally think about don't really have a safe space to like interact with you know the, the role of greek tragedy for instance so i like to think of this text with all of its gore and its savagery kind of like in the context of greek tragedy and the way that that itself is quite purifying okay so with that in mind given that there's so much like gore um yeah so karuna is saying maybe that's why it's said to recite in the morning or some people say it should be recited in daylight and i myself was saying broad daylight but i was speaking metaphorically i chanted at night a lot right because kali puja oftentimes kali puja is done at night traditionally kali puja is a nighttime thing so i chanted at night a lot so far, nothing has happened by Mother's Grace. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, I also love chanting this text like all the time. So even when I'm in the bus, like just today, I was in the bus listening to the Kila Kam Stotram. Like I just, I love that stuff, you know. Argala Stotra, I just, it's so wonderful just to have it going. It's such a big part of my practice, this Chandi. So, you know, it's like Chaitanya Deva says, no times are set, no rights are needed. So vast is thy mercy. Like that. So even though we do say things like make sure you take a bath, wear freshly laundered clothes, sit at your altar, like these are just general recommendations. They are there to create reverence and respect. As long as that's there, I think you're quite safe. But you should note that there is very like confrontational and vivid imagery. So you should note that. And so insofar as that's true, we should make three points before we begin. The first is that a beginner way of understanding this text, let me give you three levels of understanding, three ways to understand the text. A beginner's understanding of the text is that this is like a literal cosmological drama. Not something that's happening in the distant past, but something that is eternally and continuously occurring in the living present. So it's a psychodrama and it's really happening. Like there's really the divine mother and she's really killing real demons. And Durga Puja especially is the celebration and the glorification of mother's victory over those demons, literally. Okay, There's a literalist, literalist reading of this text. And I think that's quite valid. You know, I think a literalist reading is not wrong. It's valid. I think in, in some sense, that is happening. There is this divine drama being played out continuously, like really, actually. But maybe a slightly deeper, subtler reading, a more intermediate understanding is as follows. It's a metaphor, right? So the text, as gory and as lurid, as vivid as it is, it's a metaphor. And the question is, what's it a metaphor for? Well, it's a metaphor perhaps for spiritual life. I mean, take, for instance, the demon Rakta Bija. It's quite a suggestive metaphor. You see, Rakta Bija, as you might see in a few moments, 
Um, whenever you slash him, Durga, you know, she slashes Rakta Bija, what happens is drops of his blood, when they fall to the floor, they spawn new demons. So Rakta Bija has that Siddhi where he's able to like replicate himself ad infinitum. Does that sound familiar? When you resist something, it persists? Or like when you're sitting there to meditate and you're trying to suppress your thoughts, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, when you're trying to focus on your ishta, on your mantra, and you're sweeping aside thoughts, the more you fight the thoughts, the more of them there seem to be. The more you shout at someone, the more anger you throw out into the world, the more there seems to be. Like the, the basic psychological fact, both internally and externally, is that what you resist persists. So Madurga is unable to kill this demon because all aggression is only like profilerating the problem. So instead, what does she do? She projects from her third eye, the third eye of wisdom, a different approach. The goddess Kali, emaciated and horrifying. I mean, the depiction of Kali in this book is like, whoa, this is an old and ancient winter goddess, you know. But anyway, she appears. Um, and what does Kali do? Instead of fighting the demon, instead of killing him, she, she slashes him. Just be sure she's not rolling over and letting him have his way. She's attacking him. But her style of attacking is different. Rather than slashing at him and like you know, with a flurry of swords. After she cuts him, she licks him or licks the blood that pours from him. You know, so there's a lecture we gave some time back. It was called Ma Kali's Bowl of Blood, a different way of dealing with the problems of life. It's like radical acceptance, embracing in a mind-free, story-free way, just the immediacy of your experience and then transmuting suffering into enlivenment like that. We had a whole lecture about that and that's probably what's going on there. So notice that's, that's probably metaphorical. Yes, perhaps on some level um, in a mythological sense like and by mythological i don't mean unreal i just mean on some plane i'm sure that that's really happening mother's really fighting rakta bija in a literal sense but i think in our case as sadhakas as spiritual aspirants it's best regarded as an allegory as a metaphor for our sadhana the three episodes represent three types of demons that can be understood from a sankhya point of view the first two madhu and kaitaba they are tamasic demons they represent like brutish aggression the very lowest of human nature the most bestial of human nature like just aggression you know it's not a very sophisticated demon it's a very dumb demon actually um and so mother has to deal with them first you can think of these as tamasic demons these are the demons of tamas sloth sluggardly inertia like that those demons and the thing about madhu and kaitaba they exist prior to the creation of the universe so they are there preventing creation from even beginning in the first place so that's, I think, the epitome of tamas, inertia. They're like blocking any creative effort whatsoever. And Vishnu is sleeping on one of the very tamasic activities, sleeping in this episode. So anyway, Madhu and Kaitaba, from a Sankhya point of view, represent tamas, the force of inertia. Then Mahishasura, he represents rajas. He's the energy of like, conceit and pride and aggression, but not the simple-minded, like brutish, animalistic aggression of Madhu and Kaitaba. His aggression is far more refined. He's, he's a buffalo demon, meaning he still has that animalistic, bestial nature, but he's also a shapeshifter. You know, so he's able to change shapes. He become a lion, he become a buffalo. At the, at the very end, he emerges a man. So it's like how our pride, how our anger, how our self-conceit, how that too is a shapeshifter. You know, let's say I used to be, I, I, I never was, but let's say I was like this Wall Street billionaire guy, right? And I was proud about that and haughty about that. Then I decided to give up that life and become a meditator. But then I became prideful and haughty about how many hours I'm sitting every day or like how, how high up I am in the ranks of my, I don't know, meditation group or something like that. Notice the same pride is there in a new form. So that's kind of how it is with our anger and our pride and our greed and our, you know, all of these lower forces. When we fight them, we find that they hide in a new guise, in a new form, and therefore they're ever elusive. They're very difficult to deal with directly because the moment you try to make any headway against them, they dive deep. They, they, they vanish be below the, sub, the, the understanding of the conscious mind. And then they emerge later in some new form. So Mahish Asura... He's perhaps the central demon of the text. And of course, Durga Puja, the main episode that's celebrated is Durga's slaying of the demon Mahisha. But notice, in order to slay him, you know what she has to do? It's very important. They're having this big fight, right? And, and it's kind of a back and forth. It's like table tennis. Like Mahisha is giving the volleys back. He's not so easily vanquished, you know? So what does mother have to do? Like Amrita Devi just did, mother has to take a swig of a very special drink. It's a wine. See, in her Mahalakshmi form, mother drinks a wine. It's a potion. It's, what is it? It's like this like red liquid, you know, what, what is she drinking? It's pure rajas. So in order to defeat Mahishasura, who is like all this like bestial energy, the rajas incarnate, mother drinks pure rajas and she herself becomes incredibly rajasic. Her eyes start to roll about and she starts to become very like, you know, 
intoxicated with this rajas and then she destroys the demon mahisha you know so it i we had a lecture about ma kali's lion and how you know the lion of dharma like we need rajas i don't like this kind of like you know soft limpid kind of spirituality as you know that's not our style our style is that that swami vivekananda level like get up and do something you know arise awake stop not till the goal is reached don't tarry don't become like um complacent you know like keep the mind fixed on the highest and you know be dogged about that you must be strong because if you if you if you don't insist upon your ideals then the world will drag you back into that whirlpool of vishalakshi as master said back into the addictions and patterns and you'll just be sucked into all the sorrow and grief of it so you have to be strong you have to say no that place is not for me that kind of company is not for me that kind of media is not for me i am a yogi i am a spiritual practitioner i will meditate more every single day i will meditate with more intensity with more consistency you must never let up you know never let up on this um yeah, right, St. Anthony's, arise and kick some ass, Sanyas in bold. You know, if you read that poem, thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. So cease lament, Sanyas in bold, let go thy hold. Say, Om Tat Sat Om. Like when you read that, like what a clarion call. Om Tat Sat Om. Say, Om Tat Sat Om. You know, <laughs> the powerful thing. So this, this Rajas, this is what is symbolized by mother drinking this potion. She takes up like, she takes the Swami Vekananda juice, if you will. I mean, rather Swami Vekananda is drinking the mother juice here, this pure Shakti. And it gives him the strength to really do spiritual life. So Sri Ramakrishna, you know, he would talk about the bulls. He would say, you know, some bulls, if you pull their tail, they won't do anything. He says they have no substance. It's like uh, soggy rice, like wet rice. He says, some spiritual practitioners are like that. Sri Ramakrishna dismisses them. He says they're like, no substance. No. But some bulls, if you so much as touch their tail, they go, and they're like frisk about. He says that's the kind of aspirant that will make progress. That's like Swamiji, Narin. He's like that. You know, he's strong. So you have to be strong. So that idea, mother drinking the potion and through her properly channelized Rajas, she vanquishes the demon Mahishasura. Then the next episode is Shumba and Nishumba. And there are a lot of other demons here, like there's Dumra, Lochana and all that. And they all represent certain things. We can, of course, go deep into all of these details. We won't. I'm just giving you a broad overarching idea. But in this episode, these demons are perhaps the tricksiest of them all. See, Madhu and Kaitaba, straightforward demons, brute, aggressive, tamasic. Mahishasura, slightly subtler, right? Slightly subtler, um, way more clever, cleverer because he's a shapeshifter and all that. But still, relatively speaking, he's kind of a straightforward bad guy. Shumba and Nishumba, I like to joke, don't really seem like bad guys. They actually just seem like refined, like LA um, socialites. You know, <laughs> they're just hedonist. These guys, their problem is that they're very indulgent. It's all about luxury and sensuality. And they have this like refined aesthetic appreciation of, of art. They're sattvic demons, the demons of sattva. And even that, to many people who've studied Sankhya, that sounds like a paradox the demons of sattva like how could there be anything bad about sattva spiritual life is about cultivating sattva right no spiritual life is about going beyond them all in some sense so even the sattvic demons have to be overcome and mother does in her, her wonderful and inimicable way she, she overcomes them in the third and final episode so all throughout the chandi it's detailing this this episodic battle between the mother and these various forces that represent lower nature so the intermediate understanding the beginner understanding is a literalist understanding. The intermediate understanding is it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for spiritual life. It's a metaphor for life, both internal and external, if even such a division could be made. But you know what the more advanced reading is? Now, let me give you the advanced reading. So intermediate reading was good triumphs over evil. Spiritual practitioners will eventually overcome their lower nature through this wonderful battle you know by propitiating the divine mother okay the slightly subtler more non-dual reading is the divine mother is the one reality that exists and as such she transcends both categories good and bad so she doesn't kill demons she doesn't destroy them rather she converts them she tames them she redirects them so usha devi usha harding at the kali mandir she sent out a email for navaratri and in that email she said look in the mahishasura episode what gets killed is the demon, the buffalo. What comes out is a devotee. So in some of the paintings you'll see, you know, the demon is decapitated. The demon's head is lying on the floor. So the buffalo head is on the floor. But there's this man, typically a mustachioed man. He comes out and he has his palms together and he's looking up at the divine mother and his face is flushed with delight and joy. And he's praying to her. You know, what's happened is he's become purified through death in battle with her. 
So the Shakti that she represents has vanquished his lower nature and out of that lower nature emerges the devotee, the devotee of the Divine Mother. So Sri Ramakrishna, I think, was very fond of this final reading because once in, in one episode, yeah, you see that? I think in that episode, um, Rudy is showing one over here. Let me show you. Yeah, look at him. He's like, he's obviously being killed, you know, like he's being, but the, the buffalo lies vanquished and yet he's looking up at the Divine Mother just full of, full of, rapture you know so it says in the chandi it's like even towards those very foes yes i was going to say this your 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 intentions are most gracious uh because they too might attain the higher worlds through death in battle with you you know so the important thing to remember is that this is the deeper understanding the mother is not just the mother of the gods you know she's also the mother of the demons she manifests as both gods and demons. And she is just as loving and gracious towards the demons as she is towards the gods. You know, and the way she shows her love to demons is by smiting them violently and, and ferociously. Because to do so would be to finish off their karmas quickly and thereby give them the chance to quote unquote attain the higher realms, to be exalted, if you will, uh, through death in battle with her. So there, there are lines like, why did not Mahisha perish the instant he beheld your wrathful face, reddened like the rising sun? Well, it's because, why wasn't he blinded by the glaring tip of your spear point? Well, it's because you wanted him to see your beauty. You know, the reason he wasn't instantly blinded, the reason he wasn't instantly like destroyed, even though you had the power to do that, is because even towards him, you were so gracious. You wanted to give him a darshan, you know? So the important thing to remember here is, which one are you? Are you a god or a demon? A demon is someone who is uh, mostly interested in pleasure and their own self-gratification, often at the expense of others. Even you deserve mother's grace and even you will get it. But you will get it often through the violence of having to like finish with your karmas, which is wonderful, actually, that she does that for you. And if you are a god, then your treatment will be different. So Shravakashi say uh, the mother cat treats the mouse differently than she treats her own kitten. The only question is, are you a kitten or are you a mouse? And if you're a kitten, it means you're totally self-surrendered. You, you give yourself to the mother's will. You let her play the way that she wants. And you're happy to be her playmate and her worker in this world. And you want nothing for yourself. You know, so the selflessness is the definition of God nature. And selfishness is the definition of demon nature. But mother loves them both. Mother transcends both categories. So in the, in the third hymn, it's very clearly stated. No, in the first hymn even, it's clearly stated. Mahadevi Mahasuri. You know, she is Mahamoha Chabhavati. She is the great delusion. By her power, people are deluded. And most importantly, she's not just the great goddess, Mahadevi. She's also the great demoness, Maha Asuri. So a deeper, subtle understanding of this text is that it's not really a dualistic battle between good and evil. It's this wonderful play. And mother delights herself in both aspects. So like I said earlier, Dev ya 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 tatamidam jagadat mashaktiya. Oh mother, you spread out this world. And Devarata Kali, an author that I'll, I'll, I'll refer to in just a few moments, he makes this point that it's like a little girl spreading out her dolls before she plays with them. Now think of it like the little girl she wants to play a game so she puts the bad the bad guys over here and the good guys over there vishnu shariram grahanam aham ishana evacha oh mother who here can praise you you know because by your power vishnu shiva and me have assumed our embodied forms like the gods are saying this that this is also true for the demons by her power they have assumed their embodied forms and by her power they are the way that they are so it's all for mother's delight and mother's play now if you want to go deeper here you can say what is the divine mother from a devotional point of view she's the ultimate goddess from a non-dual point of view she represents the shakti in every spiritual aspirant just that the, the power and energy of being alive your body your breath the mind and its ability to remember or forget, the intellect, its ability to understand, um, all of that is the Divine Mother. She's Shakti. Once Divyananda Prana Mataji at lunch, I asked her about Shakti Sadhana. Like, what is Shakti Sadhana? Does, does Shri Ramakrishna mean, you know, puja, like ritualistic worship? And she looks at me and she goes, all Sadhana is Shakti Sadhana. It's like, whoa, that was quite the transmission. She, and I realized that she was right. Like, whether you're a Zen Buddhist, you're doing Shakti Sadhana because you're working with breath, you're working with the body, you're working with a wall, maybe, you know, all of that is Shakti. You know, your wall is Shakti, your teacher is Shakti, your Zendo is Shakti, your breath is Shakti, your body is Shakti. So whether or not you're formally worshipping Shakti, I'm sorry, you're worshipping Shakti. Because by definition, Shakti is everything that is manifest, everything that is imminent, you know. So the deeper understanding here, the non-dual understanding is there is only one reality. It's Shakti. And that Shakti can either be Ghora Shakti or Aghora Shakti. Ghora Shakti as in violent and imminent and binding, 
which is also a very powerful thing. Or it can be Agora Shakti, meaning freeing and liberating. Insofar as spiritual life is about freedom, we of course prefer Agora Shakti, but it's the same Shakti. So how do you understand this in terms of lust, greed, and anger? Think of Turiya Nandaji, who when he was young, Hari Maharaj, approached Ramakrishna and asked, how do I overcome lust? In response to this, Shri Ramakrishna said, what? my boy, why would you want to overcome lust? Yeah. Increase your lust. Redirect it towards God. Give it a God word turn. What on earth does it mean by this? Shri Ramakrishna said, don't overcome anger. Be angry at those who stand in your way to realize God. Don't, if, if, you, if you desire intercourse, then desire intercourse with Brahman. If you want to be greedy, then be greedy for God experience. If you want to be prideful, be proud to be a child of God. How Swami Vekananda, how he says, uh, do you know who I am? Do you know who we are? He says, we are the servants of Sri Ramakrishna. If I wanted, I could crush up the stars in my teeth. I could unhinge the three worlds and cast it into the void. That pride, that strength, that self-assurance that comes through humility and surrender. So Sri Ramakrishna, when, when talking about lust and greed and anger and pride, he didn't seem to be against these things as if they were bad or demonic and therefore needed to be subjugated or repressed uh, or, 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 or even combated against. They needed to be transmuted reclaimed actually and redirected what does this mean it means there's only one energy the same energy that expresses itself as lust greed anger is the very same energy that expresses itself as spirituality you know that's clear that's very important there's there's no such thing as sex and god sex and spirituality no no it's the same energy it's just about where that energy is flowing what is the object to which it is directed and um how is it working in your system and in the world around you is it creating more peace more fulfillment or is it only creating chaos and tension and anxiety for you but it's, it's the same energy it's like fire can cook or burn your house down but if you think that oh there's good fire and that fire cooks and there's bad fire and that fire burns then you've misunderstood the jandi I'm not misunderstood. You see, you're understood. It's, again, I should say it's not from error to truth that we move, but from truth to higher truth. So I would say, in, in, in so far as there's a subtler, deeper understanding, that like the subtlest understanding, by no means the most valid, just the subtlest, is that the Divine Mother is Shakti, the very energy that a spiritual aspirant has as part of their manifest experience. That is the one reality, and that reality is either binding you or freeing you. And both of them are to be recognized as good and valuable. It's just in the case of your sadhana, you prefer the Agora Shakti, the freeing energy. And so when you read the Devi Mahatmya, it's all about that. It's all about transcendence and energy. That's what you want. And that's what you're getting from a study, a reverent study of the Devi Mahatmya. Okay. So having said that, um, we should recognize that the Divine Mother is not frivolous. She doesn't just willy-nilly like kill and create chaos. Ultimately, she's benevolent. Like, Ultimately, even for demons, her intentions are most gracious. So recognizing this, this subtlest non-dual understanding of the text, let's plunge right in. Okay, so um, I want to give you a few resources now. So in so far, I hope you're inspired. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the Chandi and its significance. You know, you've heard about the Beej mantras in the Chandi. Um, by the way, Rudy, you're really freezing. I'm wondering if it's you or me. Am I freezing for you? Some of you are moving. Like Brandt is fine. Brandt is just moving about. Can you hear me and see me okay? Yeah, everybody's good? Okay, good. All right, good. Let's continue then. So I want to give you a few resources. Now that so far as you know, you, you might be inspired to start studying the Chandi. My favorite and what I'll read to you from now is the um, Devi Mahatmyam by Swami Jagadishwaranandaji. So the only downside to this text is that there's no English transliteration. There's no Roman alphabet transliteration. So here's what it looks like inside. It's Devanagri. All the hymns are in Devanagri, but there's English translation in the footnotes. There's no transliteration, but there is translation. And it's an excellent, very beautiful translation. I like it a lot because there are the verse numbers and there are footnotes that explain some of the more abstruse points in the translation. So this is my favorite translation of all time. Swami Jagadishwarananda's Devi Mahatmyam. The reason also I like this is because it's it's pocket size. So as you can see, it's very my copy is quite beat up. It's the Divine Mother herself. I should be taking better care of you, but I <laughs> seem to you know I mean, it's it's very it's well used. It's well worn. It's traveled everywhere with me, and I like it because it can travel, you know. Oh, cool. Maybe, yeah, maybe they've put out a new one. Oh, there is one without Devanagri and just transliteration, right? I think I might have seen a call. That, that's a good point. Maybe there are new additions now. This is obviously an older one, but this is this is my favorite one because it can travel with you. So I really love this and I highly recommend this. And just reading the English from it, as you'll see in a few moments, is profound. Really beautiful. 
Now, another very good resource. I myself am only just discovering. I have had this book, but I've never really like looked at it until uh, it came time to practice this time around Navaratri. I thought I'll pick it up and look at it. I was like, whoa, it's awesome. It's awesome because not only does it have a really great introduction that I enjoyed very much, an introduction that includes like historical context, you know, it includes philosophical context, but there's commentary. So not only is it a good translation, a beautiful translation um, that includes the original Devanagari in the back with transliteration, but there's also commentary after each of the translations, which I think are so valuable, but even more valuable. What I really, really enjoyed about this text is it's not just the Devi Mahatmya, which would, would of itself be enough, but like it also includes other things, you know, other associated texts, like one of them being the Devi Shukta from the Rig Veda, which I suppose uh, I'll have to speak to you about on another night, given time constraints. But that, to me, is perhaps next to the Devi Mahatmyam, some of the most profound, like, Shakta literature ever. It's the oldest. It's a young woman, a daughter of a Rishi, who discovers her identity with the Divine Mother and sings about it. You know, by my power alone are the mighty made mighty like that. She, it's, it's maybe the first time in human civilization that someone has uttered a non-dual truth. And I'm so proud that in Indian culture, it was a woman who first said it. A young woman, not an old bearded sage in some mountain, but a young woman was the first person perhaps in human history to, to loudly proclaim her oneness with God. Non-duality, you know. I think that's so special to me. Vak Devi. She's been, since you hemorized as goddess word or goddess speech. Okay, anyway. That's in there. There's the pra, the anika, rahasya. You know, there's like the shapta shloki, which we heard um, Ishantji read the other night. There's that durga shapta shloki. That's there also. So there's all these other texts, other very, you know, va, uh, there's the vaikritika, rahasya, all these like great shakta texts. And in the introduction, I saw that it was Swami Sarvadevanandji that was credited for including all of these texts. So he apparently uh, advised Devarata Kaliji to include some of these other affiliate and associated Shakta texts along with his critical edition of the Devi Mahatmyam. So I really like this. It's an academic book, yet it's by a devotee. So it's dripping with bhava. It's not, it's not a dry academic read. Yet for the intellect, there's many juicy things. So this is perhaps a very good resource to be acquainted with. There's another resource that I also am just now myself discovering. I've actually never read it before until this year. I, I've, I've known of it, but I've never read it before. And this is The Veiling Brilliance. So this, I picked it up and it's so beautiful what he's done. So this is Devadatta Kali's second book. And it's a, it's a rather free translation, but really it's a novelization, if you will. It's a prose, entirely in prose. And it's the story of the Devi Mahatmyam told in prose in like a novelistic style. So what David Atakali does is he takes his liberties. He really does. He fleshes out characters. He adds so many scenes that are not there in the Devi Mahatmyam. And I think that was valuable because in so doing, he's brought the text to life in a sense. Like he's really given these characters depth and dimension by describing, describing them in this very modern novelistic style, you know, which I think is so cool. So this is a very, very good resource um, to pick up. And I think it might be the first thing that you read, you know, before you pick up In Praise of the Goddess, which is a slightly heavier read. And before you even take up the Devi Mahatmyam proper, you might like to just get a taste of the text through the veiling brilliance. You know, so that's, that's another. So I, I just want to show you these three books. Now, I also want to give you a great Spotify resource or an Apple Music resource or whatever your streaming music platform might be. There's a great artist. She's kind of like the voice of Indian temples, if you will. Her name is Anuradha Padawal. I'm sure many of you have heard of her. She, you know, is a devotee par excellence. She doesn't do any ritualistic stuff. She just has a Kali that she she regards as her very own daughter and she just loves that Kali with all her heart and soul. I know this because she's often visited the Kali Mandir and Swami Bhajananda Ji and, and Usha Devi tell me about her bhakti, her devotion and how it's not at all ritualistic and all just sincere, pure bhakti. And she's a great singer. She used to be like a movie star type very famous for like making secular films and all that. But then, you know, through the grace of the Divine Mother, she became Mother Songbird, if you will. And she just sings to Ma and all of her songs are just, again, dripping with that bhava, the ecstasy of true devotion. So you'll find a lot of great um, hymns from the Chandi rendered into the most beautiful music by this artist, Anuradha Padua. And I particularly love her Argala Stotram and her Kilakam Stotram and all of that. So you might check that out on Spotify or, or Apple Music or what have you. So that's a good resource for listening to the Chandi chanted in Sanskrit. And you might also chant along. There's some stuff by the Bombay Sisters, which is kind of a cool and flashy name. And they also do some cool re recitations of the Chandi. Um, 
I think there's even a kind of EDM version of the Mahishasura Mardini Stotram by a group called Shanti People. I just recently discovered it's like it goes hard. It's like an EDM kind of thing, <laughs> like a like a like a psychedelic trance sort of house music style. So there are all these versions out there, which is I think kind of cool. And so if you want to listen to the Chandi. If you want to make it a part of your lived experience, then you're going to. Uh, Rebecca's like, like, can I have the the trance EDM version, please? No, this is. I couldn't find one for the Chandi. Maybe you should make one. But I did find one from this group called Shanti People, Mahishasura Mardini Sutram, which, by the way, is another text that we talk about a lot um, over the course of Navaratri. Many say that the Mahishasura Mardini Sutram, if you chant it, it's equivalent to chanting the Chandi. That's how powerful the Mahisha Mahadani Stotram is. It's written perhaps by Shankara. Perhaps it was written by, you know, um, Ravana. Nobody really knows. It, it could be ancient or it could be fairly modern. But the Mahisha Asura Mahadani Stotram, it's about mother killing the demon Mahisha. Mahisha Mahadani, meaning the slayer of the demon Mahisha. Or, as you now know, the tamer and converter of the demon Mahisha. So that Stotra, there is a kind of dub, so not dubstep, more like house version of it by this group, Shanti people. So you'll find lots of versions of that. It's super cool. Not many people have done the Chandi though, because as I said earlier, it's kind of, it's it's more niche text and known only, I think, in the community of Shaktas. But Anuradha Paudwal, I think she makes such, Paudwal makes beautiful renditions of these hymns in the Chandi and so authentic. And so I think it really brings the text to life to, to, to listen to it. In the Phala Sotra, the fruit Sotra, Meaning the the final recit the, the 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 outcome you know they often Sanskrit spiritual literature at the very end they'll tell you what you get by reciting this text or what you get by studying it and in this text it says you get all these things you get fearlessness protection from robbers protection from enemies your enemies will be vanquished like you'll be happy you'll have progeny your 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 family will rejoice like all these great stuff right all all this um, Krishna Vastu if you will great stuff but it says you get all of that through merely hearing the Chandi, not through um, reciting it or understanding it or memorizing it. No, no, no. The Falastottam, the, the fruit um, hymn, it says clearly that just to, through listening to the Chandi alone, all of these benefits come to you. Just through remembering the mother alone, all of these benefits come to you. And that's quite profound. So I thought I would give you some audio that you might like so that you can acquaint yourself with the Chandi. Anyway, this has been nothing more than an introductory class. All I wanted to do was give you an outline, like sketch a little bit about the Chandi. I wanted to inspire you. Above all, I wanted to read you from Swamiji's own words, what it means to be a Shakta. Fearless, absolutely fearless. Boldly go in the direction of your love. You know, like go to Ma. She's your very own mother, not a foster mother. That was the main purpose of the class. Then I just wanted to put this text in front of you. I just wanted to float it by you because we just celebrated Navaratri. And I really sincerely hope that this will be a part of your daily practice. So having given you a few resources, let me just say one more thing before I close the meeting and maybe take a few questions and then I'll do a reading. Certainly I'll do a reading, but it won't be in this recording. I'll just do the recording. I'll close the recording and then we'll do a reading together um, maybe just a little bit i don't know if we can cover the whole i, I kind of intend to do the whole thing now i'm looking at the time and i'm like that was too ambitious <laughs> maybe that's a separate class maybe that's next week um but anyway for for this class i just wanted to introduce the text to you give you a broad overarching idea as to what the text is its context and its importance but now let me say a few final things um, now that you have all the resources to start your journey into the Chandi, i want to say one final thing is like how do you incorporate it into your daily life into your sadhana like how does it become a viable spiritual practice for you. Okay. Well, in most cases, you might have a mantra. Your guru might have given you a mantra and you might be chanting that mantra, reciting it daily, japa. So you're doing japa. Now that's your main practice, it seems like. So you're doing a kind of raja yoga practice where you keep the mind fixed on a particular deity, which your guru gave you. And you're reciting the mantra associated to that deity, which your guru also gave you. So that's your main practice. But around that practice, there are things like daily ritual worship. So you might be offering flowers, incense, fire, food to your Ishta Devata and maybe other deities too. Now, besides that, there's also Hatha Yoga, where you're doing daily postural practice to keep up your fitness and to keep the blood and the electricity flowing so that your Raja Yoga will be really fruitful and really deep. So you've got Puja, you've got Hatha Yoga, you've got your basic ethical practices of being in the world as a good person and a loving person like all of those things are are there they're all part of your life as a spiritual aspirant so how how does the chandi fit in you know where does the chandi fit into all of this so daily ritualistic 
recitation of the chandi is often highly recommended for those who are on the shakta path because the chandi itself is a kind of mantra you might find that you don't just get initiated into a mantra you might find that as as part of your diksha you're actually being initiated into this text where you study it verse by verse and you commit it to memory so when you commit something to memory it's special it becomes part of you it's, it's wonderful to read something that's that's wonderful but when you read it a lot when you chant it a lot then you can do it from memory. And I would argue that when you do it from memory is when you really do it from the heart. You know, um, Raja Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, he would always be able to tell whether a person was singing based on the book or from their heart, from memory. He was always, at, wh whether he was in the room or not, he could be in a room three doors down, but he would immediately know, ah, that boy is singing from memory. Ah, that boy is reading from a book. It's different. There's a difference because it's one thing to like ride a bicycle and be really conscious of how to pedal and how to hold the steering bar and what have you. But it's quite another thing to ride the bicycle freely down the street and feel the wind in your face. So first step is to commit it to memory. Second step is to contemplate its meaning. So there are these two steps. They're kind of advanced, actually. So my next question is, how do you commit it to memory? You know, it's, it's quite a big thing. How do you make it part of your life? And don't be afraid of memorizing things. Some people are, are like, like very intimidated by the task of memorizing, you know, but don't be intimidated. First of all, grit your teeth. Spiritual life is a struggle from time to time. So don't worry. You can do hard things. Right? So even if you think it's hard to memorize, don't worry, you'll get over it. You can do it. Just do it. Um, but secondly, there are some strategies for memorization. Like you don't just have to memorize the whole text all at once. Why don't you start like by taking one verse at a time and for one month, just chanting that verse. You know, just make it a part of your life, make it a part of your being. And then when you really have that verse down, then you go to the second verse. So instead of trying to like clumsily memorize the whole thing from start to finish, just start with one thing. And then from there, slowly build upon that. So the question then is, which one should you start with? Most people, I think, don't chant the whole Chandi. I think insofar as they're doing a Devi Mahatmyam practice, and, and this is true for me too, what we do is we chant the hymns from the Chandi which has been my guru's recommendation. So as I was saying earlier, when Mahisha, when Mahisha Asura Maradini, you know, when she slays the demon Mahisha, the gods appear and they praise her. And that prayer, that praise is called Shakra Dikrita Devi Stutihi. It's very long. It's the longest of the hymns and it's very charged and very poetic. Now you might think, okay, because it's so profound, I might want to start with this. It seems like the central hymn. But then you might also think, no, because it's very long, I might leave that aside for now. Then you, you know, there's the fourth hymn, Narayani Namo Stute. The fourth hymn is chanted when she slays Shumba and Nishumba. That also is a rather long hymn. Now, both hymns two and four are in um, meters that are quite complex, quite exalted literarily speaking and so therefore they might be a little less accessible so verses two hymns two and four maybe you might consider them intermediate to advanced practices whereas verses one and three the thing about them is they're relatively quite short compared to the rest of the text and they're both of them in anushtu meter which many people find very natural anushtu meter is the meter in which the gita is composed you know, Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsa Sangate Shupajayate. You know, you're familiar with that melody. It's also uh, Vigyana Bhairava Tantra. Bhaiya Sarvam Ravayati Sarva Govyapako Kile Itti Bhairava Shabdasya Santato Charana Chivaha. So, uh, 16 beats per half a verse, 32 beats for the whole verse to match with the phases of the moon, 16 days of waxing, 16 days of waning. So this Anushtub, it's very natural, it's very sing-songy. And so because verse, uh, sorry, hymns one and three are in those meters, those might appeal to you a little more. You know, you might want to start with them. And I particularly like starting with the first hymn. Although a lot of people will say you should start with the third hymn. Why? Because it's quite easy to memorize since most of the hymn follows a kind of repeating motif. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, blank, Rupena Sangsita, Namastase, 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 Namo Namaha. What goes into the blank, that's the only thing you have to really memorize. You know, Vishnu Mayeti Shabdita, Chetaneti Adbhidiyate, Buddhi, uh, Nidra, Shuddha, Chaya, Shakti, Trishna, like you just fill in the blanks with like these words, you know, um, Vishnu slumber, consciousness, intellect, sleep, hunger, shadow, power, thirst, forgiveness, like that, that's easier to memorize, just these singular Sanskrit words, and you just fit them into the structure of the Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu scheme. You know, so a lot of people start with the third hymn, and I think that's a really good idea because to chant the third hymn, as many people say, is to chant the whole chandi. 
Um, and we have a video out. I think it's called it's called Apara Ajita Sutihi. That's the name of the third hymn. And there's a video on that uh, discussing why it's so powerful and so important. So I won't say more now. You can refer to that lecture where we discuss like in what sense is it true to say that by chanting this, you've chanted the whole chandi. In what sense? So we explore that quite a bit in that lecture. And there we also recite it. So anyway, that being said, many people like to start with the third hymn. So that could be your practice. Your homework could be to acquaint yourself with the text, to find a nice translation, a nice transliteration, and then just memorize the third hymn. Uh, another hymn, I think my favorite hymn of the four hymns, is the first hymn. I love it very much. A great Shaiva Acharya once told me about his experience with his guru. When he was coming down a mountain, having visited this like very important Kali or, or Durga temple, as they were walking down, his guru suddenly started singing this first hymn. Now, this was when the guru was um, imbued with a very important experience. Like Clearly, the guru was in ecstasy. And the guru, one thing this Shaiva Acharya told me was that the guru had this vast memory. And he had under his thumb or like in his back pocket, like all possible Shaiva Shakta literature, right? He could have sung anything. He could have sung anything. He could have sung uh, Saundara Lahari by Shankara. He could have sung Mahishasura Mardini Sotram. He, he could have sung anything. He could have sung Kilakam Sotram, Jayanti Mangala Kali, oh, sorry, Argala Sotram, you know, um, Rupam Dehi, Jayan Dehi. He could have chanted anything. Yasho Dehi. He could, he could have done it, but he chose to chant the first hymn of the Chandi. You know? Uh, yeah, uh, Amrita Devi saying, I remember you quoted a line from it after Hatha Yoga one time. And I was like, wait, what the what was that? It's powerful, right? It's like, I, in my opinion, this first hymn is, is, I mean, it's not in my opinion. It's what I heard from the Shaiva Acharya who is relating to me a story from his guru. The fact that his guru chose the first hymn, Brahma Sutihi, to chant when he was in the heights of his, his ecstasy with the Divine Mother tells you something. It told me something. So I was inspired by that. And I, yeah, it like, Oh, I just made that first hymn like the center of my being. And every day I chanted, if not, if not more than once a day, at least once a day, it's like so central to my practice because it's a hymn of invocation. While the other hymns are hymns of praise, right? This particular hymn is a hymn of invocation. In Brahma Suttihi, what happens, and I've told this story many times before, but what happens is that Brahma is being threatened. He's being intimidated by Madhu and Kaitaba who are shaking the lotus stalk you know, and he's sitting on the lotus and these demons are rattling the lotus stalk and he's like freaking out. So he turns to Vishnu, to God, to help him. But God can't help him. Why? Because God is asleep. By whose power has God fallen asleep? By the power of the Divine Mother, the deluder. So instead of propitiating God, who is transcendental and hard to approach, he instead goes to Mother, who is the power over God. You know, so he sings this hymn. Brahma Suttihi means what Brahma sung, you know, Brahma's hymn, Brahma Uvacha, Brahma sings this hymn. And when he sings this hymn, mother appears and, and she awakens Vishnu from his slumber. She rouses him in order that he may slay the two great Asuras, Madhu and Kaitaba. And not only that, Vishnu is powerless against the Asuras because in the Devi Bhagavatam, what we learn, the backstory is that mother gave Madhu and Kaitaba their powers because Madhu and Kaitaba chanted a particular Bij Mantra for many aeons. Mother appeared to them in, as a flash of lightning and gave them these powers where they can't be killed unless they want to die, right? So um, Vishnu can't beat them. Because mother has empowered them. So in order to beat them, what mother does, Vishnu prays to the divine mother actually for help. And then what mother does is she makes them prideful. And in their pride, Madhu and Kaitaba offer Vishnu a boon and Vishnu uses that boon to slay them. So it's a very important point that like this first hymn, Brahma Suti, is mother being invoked to arouse that inner divinity within us. Um, it's a it's a it's a hymn of protection. It's so sweet. This like little baby Brahma in the lotus. He's frightened. He's terrified of the world. And what do you do when you're scared? You plunge into the mother's bosom. You bury your head in your mother's skirts. Like that's one of the vibes of the hymn. And the hymn itself describes what mother is in the most exalted and refined of spiritual uh, philosophical language. So that's why I like it. So you might start with that. You might start with the first hymn. In my own practice, it's the first and third hymn that I make central. Um, both of them, you can easily memorize. So one more thing I want to say about memory, right? So we gave one technique, which is take one verse at a time. Another technique, and this is the one that was more true for me with regards to the first hymn, you can just chant it every day um, and read it. And one day, you won't need to read it anymore. You know, so that, that's my preferred method. Instead of taking it one verse at a time and trying to memorize one verse at a time, which I do for, for, for hymns two and four, 
Um, with him, number one, it was more a case of like just reciting it from a book every day. And after like a year, maybe even less, like six months of doing so, one day I just, I was meditating on a beach and I like wanted to chant it. I just felt moved to, to say something like that. And I was like, wait a minute, it's here. Like the, I don't have to take the book anymore. Like it's here. Like it's it's in my heart, in my mind, and it just flowed through nicely and smoothly and beautifully. So sometimes these texts appear like grace, like a gift. You just read it every day, and one day you realize you don't need the training wheels anymore. It's there. It's now a part of your being. So I would also recommend this: just read the chandi in Sanskrit in a transliteration every single day, and you'll find that one day you'll just have it down by memory. Okay. So a strategy for working with the chandi is start with the hymns. There are four hymns. Acquaint yourself with them first. Then, after you have the four hymns, then you might learn Argala Stotram or Kilakam Stotram. Those are like opening hymns. So you learn those parts. Then you might start tackling it chapter by chapter. You might, you know, 13 chapters, you can start memorizing chapter one. And then after, I don't know, two or three months, you can try memorizing chapter two. And then after, you know, 13 or so periods like this, you'll have the whole book down. And one day you'll be able to chant it through cover to cover. It might take about three hours to do the whole sadhana. It depends on how quickly you're chanting it, but you might be able to chant it in Sanskrit cover to cover, which I think in and of itself is a profound and revelatory exercise. Okay, so that's how we do Devi Mahatmyam um, Sadhana, just reciting it every single day. But even better than that, what the Devi Mahatmyam itself says is just to hear it. You know, never mind memorizing, never mind reciting, just hear it. Just hear it every day. That alone is enough. But honestly, you know, I just want to say this before we close. There are a lot of people who do this. Like Sri Ramakrishna, he joked about this. He said, you know, how, do you, how, many, how much japa people are doing every day? They're doing so much japa. And he would joke. He said, there are some people who, you know, they'll recite the whole Gita before they have even one grain of rice in the morning. But they're not making any spiritual progress. And why not? I just said the text is powerful and of its own right. I think that it really is. But what Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda and, and this lineage seem to be suggesting is that it's not enough, maybe, for most of us to just mechanically recite something. Patanjali says, Tad japam tad artha bhavanam. Japa is not just mechanical recitation. Even that is good, and you should do it. But it's about also contemplating and, and meditating upon the meaning of what you're chanting. So I think even deeper than merely hearing, which is, of, of course, in of itself so powerful, and even deeper, I would go so far as to say, even deeper than memorizing and reciting is understanding. So if you never memorize it, if you never recite it, if you could just understand it, that alone is enough. You know, so hear it in English. And every day, just think about what it means. Like, what does it mean for mother to slay these demons? What do these demons represent? What does mother represent in me? What is it to be a devotee of the divine mother? Am I a demon or a god? And what makes a demon demon and a god god? Like, these are questions that come up. Um, why is the text arranged in this way? Why first Madhu and Gaitaba? Like, maybe these are your questions going into the text. And as you contemplate these, that to me is a very high sadhana. And of course, we can't end without saying the highest sadhana of all, even higher than understanding, even higher than memorizing and reciting, even higher than hearing, is simply surrendering. All this repetition of mantra, all this recitation of chandi, all this contemplation upon the meaning, all of that is there to do only one thing, to create in you sincerity and earnestness for God. Once that genuine love for the Divine Mother is awakened, it will do the rest. So the only real sadhana Sri Ramakrishna stresses in his teaching is vyakulata, sincerity, earnestness. That's all that's needed. The only thing um, we're here to do is create that earnestness, that sincerity, like um, a deranged person, like a restless person looking for his mother or her mother or their beloved sister long lost, like that. Once that approaches, we approach that. Once that emerges in us, then our sadhana is bearing fruit. When we can cry tears for God, weeping for God, when our, when our hair stands on end, at a single repetition of the mother's name, when a thrill passes through our being, like the electric joy of just one repetition of the mantra, then we'll know we're making progress. So as, as always, um, having said everything we've said, we can make it very simple by saying it's only about that, that surrender and simplicity. So the takeaway is if we can just let mother have our, her way with us, we would then only, and only then be able to call ourselves shaktas. Here is, in closing, the first hymn of the Chandi. Brahma Vacha Brahma said Om 
ಚಂದ್ರಿಕಾ ಸ್ವಾಹಾ ಸ್ವಧಾ ವಶತ್ಕಾರಸ್ವರಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಸುಧಾಕ್ಷರೆ ನಿತ್ಯೆ ತ್ರಿಧಾ ಮಾತ್ರಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಸ್ಥಿತ ಅನ್ನ ಮಾತ್ರ ಸ್ಥಿತ ನಿತ್ಯಾಚಾರ್ಯ ವಿಶೇಷತ ಸಾತ್ವ ಸಾವಿತ್ರಿ ತ್ವೇವ ಜನನಿ ಪರ ತ್ವಯತಾರ್ಯತೆ ವಿಶ್ವ ತ್ವಯತೃಜ್ಯತೆ ಜಗತ್ ತ್ವಯತಾಲ್ಯತೆ ದೇವಿ ತ್ವತ್ಸ್ಯಂತೆ ಚರ್ವದ ವಿಶಿಷ್ಟೋ ಶಿಷ್ಟಿ ಸ್ಥಿತಿಪಾಲನೆ ತಥಾ ಸಂಹೃತಿ ರೂಪಾಂತೆ ಜಗತು ಸ್ಯಜಗನ್ಮಯ ಮಹಾವಿಂದ್ಯಾ ಮಹಾಮಾಯ ಮಹಾಮೇಧ ಮಹಾಸ್ಮೃತಿ ಮಹಾಮೋಹ ಚ ಭಾವತಿ ಮಹಾದೇವಿ ಮಹಾಸುರಿ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿಸ್ವಸ್ಯುಣತ್ರಯ ವಿಭಾವಿ ಕಾಲರಾತ್ರಿರ್ಮಹಾರಾತ್ರಿರ್ಮೋಹರಾತ್ರಿಶಾರುಣೀಶ್ವರೀ ಹೀ ಬೋಧಿರ್ಬೋಧಲಕ್ಷಣ ಲಜ್ಜಾಪುಷ್ಟಿಷ್ಟಾತುಷ್ಟಿಷ್ಟಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರೇವ ಕದ್ಗಿನೀ ಶೂಲಿನಿ ಘೋರಾ ಗದಿನಿ ಚಕ್ರಿಣಿ ತಾಂಕಿನಿ ಚಾಪಿನಿ ಬಾನಭೂಷುಂದಿ ಪರಿಗಾಯುದ ಸೌಮ್ಯ ಸೌಮ್ಯಾತರಾಶೇಷ ಸೌಮ್ಯೇಭ್ಯಸ್ವತಿ ಸುಂದರಿ ಪರಾಪರಾಮೇವ ಪರಮೇಶ್ವರಿ ಯಚಿತ್ ಕ್ವಚಿದ್ ವಸ್ತು ಸದ ಸದ್ವಾಕೆ ತರ್ವಸ್ಯ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಸಾತ್ವ ಕಂ ಸ್ತೂಯಸೆ ಮಯ ಯಯ ತ್ವಯ ಜಗತ್ಷ್ಟ ಜಗತ್ ಪಾತೋ ಜಗತ್ ಸೋಪಿ ನಿದ್ರಾವಶಮ್ಮಿತ ಕಸ್ವಾಂ ಸ್ತೋತು ವಿಹೇಶ್ವರ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಶರೀರಗ್ರಹಣ ಮಹಮೀಶಾನ ಕಾರಿತಸ್ತೆ ಯಥೋತಸ್ವ ಖಸ್ತೋತು ಶಕ್ತಿಮನ್ ಭೇತ್ ಸಾತ್ವಿತ್ತ ಪ್ರಭಾವೈರ್ಸ್ವೈರುದಾರೈರ್ದೇವಿ ಸಂಸ್ತುತ ಮೋಹಯೈತೌ ದುರಾದರ್ಶ ಅಸುರೌ ಮಧು ಕೈಥಭೌ ಪ್ರಬೋಧಂ ಚ ಜಗತ್ ಸ್ವಾಮೀ ನೀಯತಾಚ್ಯುತೋ ಲಘು ಬೋಧಶ್ಚ ಕ್ರಿಯತಾಮಸ ಹಂತು ಮೇ ತೌ ಮಹಾಸುರ ಬೋಧಶ್ಚ ಕ್ರಿಯತಾಮಸ ಹಂತು ಮೇ ತೌ ಮಹಾಸುರ ನಮಸ್ಚಂದಿಕಾಯ Brahma said, You are Swaha and Swadha. You are verily the Vashat Kara and embodiment of Swara. You are the nectar, O eternal and imperishable one. You are the embodiment of the threefold Matra, Om. You are half a Matra, though eternal. You are verily that which cannot be uttered specifically. You are Savitri, the supreme mother of the devas. By you is this universe born. By you this world is created. By you it is protected, O Devi, and you always consume it at the end. O you who are always of the form of the whole world. At the time of creation, you are the form of the creative force. At the time of sustentation, you are the form of the protective power. and at the time of the dissolution of the world you are of the form of the destructive power you are the supreme knowledge as well as the great nascience the great intellect and contemplation also you are the great delusion the great devi as also the great asuri you are the primordial cause of everything 
bringing into force the three gunas, qualities. You are the dark night of periodic dissolution, sleep. You are the great night of final dissolution, pralaya, and the terrifying night of delusion. You are the goddess of good fortune, the ruler, modesty, intelligence, characterized by knowledge, bashfulness, nourishment, contentment, tranquility, and forbearance. Armed with sword and spear, club, discus, conch, bow, arrow, sling, and iron mace, you are terrible. And at the same time, you are pleasing, yea, more pleasing than all the pleasing things, and exceedingly beautiful. You are indeed the supreme Ishwari, beyond the high and the low. And whatever or wherever a thing exists, real or unreal, whatever power all that possesses, is you yourself. O oh, you who are the soul of everything, how can I extol you more than this? By you, even he who creates, sustains, and devours the world is put to sleep. Who here is capable of extolling you? Who is capable of praising you? You who have made all of us, Vishnu, myself, and Shiva, take our embodied forms. O oh, Devi, being lauded thus, bewitch these two unassailable asuras, Madhu and Kaitaba, with your superior powers. Let Vishnu, the master of the world, be quickly awakened from sleep and rouse up his nature to slay these two great asuras. Rishiruvacha. There, the Devi of delusion, extolled thus by Brahma, the creator, in order to awaken Vishnu for the destruction of Madhu and Kaitaba, drew herself out from his eyes, mouth, nostrils, arms, heart, and breast, and appeared in the sight of Brahma, of inscrutable birth. Janardana, Lord of the Universe, quitted by her, rose up from his couch on the universal ocean and saw those two evil asuras, Madhu and Kaitaba, of exceeding heroism and power, with eyes red in anger, endeavoring to devour Brahma. Thereupon the all-pervading Bhagavan Vishnu got up and fought with the asuras for five thousand years, years, using his own arms as weapons. And they, frenzied with their exceeding power and deluded by Maha Maya, exclaimed to Vishnu, Ask a boon from us. Bhagavan Vishnu said, If you are satisfied with me, you must both be slain by me now. What need is there of any other boon here? My choice is this much indeed. The Rishi said, Rishi Ruvacha, those two asuras, thus bewitched by Mahamaya, gazing then at the entire world turned into water, told Bhagavan, the lotus-eyed one, Slay us at the spot where the earth is not flooded with water. Rishiruvacha, saying, Be it so, Bhagavan Vishnu, the great wielder of the conch, discus and mace, took them unto his loins and thus severed their heads with his discus. Thus she, Mahamaya, herself appeared when praised by Brahma. She herself appeared when praised by Brahma. Now listen again to the glory of this Devi, I tell you. Here ends the first chapter, called The Slaying of Madhu and Kaitaba of the Devi Mahatmya in Markandeya Purana during the period of Savarni, the Manu. Om Shanti 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 He Hare He Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanam Astu Om Namaskar Nikaye